afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager here at Barometer Capital, and we welcome you so warmly to another Barometer Readings webcast. Joining me today is our Chief Executive Officer and Chief Investment Officer, David Burroughs, who will be pleased to provide you with a macro overview. And of course, at the tail end of his conversation, we would be happy to address your questions. So don't be shy. You can email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca, or you can hit us up on the Zoom or the chat by a Q&A or the chat here on Zoom. And uh, on that note, I turn the conversation over to the one and only David Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. Hey, Pamela, how are you? Great. Thank you so much. Uh, always a pleasure. We look forward to uh, your webcast. Great. Well, listen, thanks, everybody, for, for joining. <clears throat> here we are the 30th of January. And just off the top, you know, as they say, as goes January, goes the rest of the year uh, from uh, from my lips to God's ears. Let's let's uh, hope that that's the case. Certainly, you know, things are shaping up. We are midway through the earnings season. So far, earnings coming in about 7% ahead of estimates. Uh, revenue growth also coming in ahead of estimates, uh, which is pos positive. Uh, we're going to go do a little bit of a deep dive into market internals, take a look at what's working, what's not, <clears throat> and talk a little bit about how that impacts our positioning uh, as a firm. We've come into this year with some pretty clear views as to where we think things are going. Uh, it's been playing out uh, sort of in the right direction over the last nine months uh, and sort of continues to do so. So let's just jump in and, uh, and, and have a look at what's going on. So first of all, you know, we continue to think we're in a structural bull market that started in 2013 in the U.S. market. U.S. stock market has way outperformed the rest of the world, as we've talked about over the last several weeks. Uh, and most importantly, uh, as we've discussed over the last two years, eventually you get through these cyclical bear markets. We came down and touched the rising 200-week moving average in the S&P in October of 2022. Uh, and while it certainly hasn't been a straight line since, we pulled back in the fall into the end of October, but here we are now. I think it's seven uh, new closing highs for the S&P 500 over the last eight days. Um, the uh, S&P just slightly negative today, <clears throat> but certainly market tone has been quite good. We know that historically, once you eventually make a new high after an extended period of not making new highs, you tend to have three to four years of good returns going forward. And again, not in a straight line, but that's a very positive thing. One year, two years, three years out. <clears throat> and unless this is very different than what we've seen historically, you know, we've seen a cyclical bear market come and go. Of course, the thing we're always afraid of is what happens through these secular bear markets. When you slice through the 200 week like a knife through butter, that certainly was not the case in this one. Uh, and so we look forward to say, you know, where should we be positioned? Are we positioned in the right spots? What's working, what's not? The end the S&P, as, as we mentioned, we look at the near term, this is December 2021. This is the low in October, 2022. We've been working our way higher and clearly well above the highs from December of 21 at this point. US market has, you know, extended its outperformance versus the global markets. Although over the last few months, that outperformance has wobbled as we've seen other global markets start to perform. You know, the Canadian stock market and our home market, you know, had a very choppy year in 2023, but ultimately in the fall, after the correction into the end of October, resolved and started working its way higher as it did over the course of this past week. And just once again, to pull the lens back, you know, we've exited this period of consolidation during the global central bank tightening uh, and have you know closed decisively above that congestion range, which would suggest that you know after going sideways from 2008 through 2020, you know we are resuming this upward secular move in stocks in Canada. Uh, Canadian equities, though, have been sold dramatically by global investors over the last two years. I would argue this probably provides a mismatch in positioning versus what's actually happening in the market and that there's a good chance we could see net inflows. We've started to see inflows come back into the Canadian market, but the outflows were really as significant, if not more significant than what happened in the financial crisis 2007 and into 2009. So when we see reversals take place, 
as we did in 2020, as we did in 2008, it tends to go on for quite some time and likely Canadian market can benefit from some global flows. TSX price earnings multiple, you know, below the uh, median range over time, just a little over 13 times earnings. So certainly not expensive. And then when we look around the world, we see other global markets doing similar things. Most importantly, the Nikkei, uh, after going sideways from 1991 through 2020, you know, is marking its way higher. And uh, notably, people like Warren Buffett stepping in to buy shares as the heavy weighting in financials and industrials seem to play well into the current environment in the market, this reflationary environment. India continues to march higher also, now up just over 20% from the October lows, uh, making new all-time highs. Uh, Mexico, you know, after consolidating through sort of the Fed cycle, again, trading very close to new highs. And we know that global stocks are inexpensive on a price earnings multiple relative to U.S. stocks. So notable that after long periods of outperformance, they're starting to perform well, and there's lots of value that can get squeezed out of global stocks, which is exactly why we took our Canadian, our sorry, our, our barometer discipline leadership equity fund and converted it at year end to a global equity portfolio of 60 significant developed and developing market global stocks outside of North America. So that spread is as big as it has been, you know, over the course of the last 20 years. And and uh, really provides, I think, uh, good entry points. China continues to be sloppy, however. We know that money continues to flow out of, uh, out of China. And when we look at the long-term picture here, look, Chinese, uh, uh, the ASHR, which tracks the CSI 300, down 60% from the highs in 2016 and trading right near the bottom of the range. So this has been a market that we have avoided. <clears throat> On the fixed income front, you know, yields bottomed in 2020 and started to rise. That was a significant generational low, much like we saw the generational low in the late 1940s. And despite, you know, some brief periods of consolidation where bonds bounced, it's not a very pretty picture. This is a picture that would say we have seen a long-term reversal in rates and likely, even though we're gonna see some pullbacks in yields, which means rallies and bonds, they probably, you know, should be uh, should be sold rather than bought. This drawdown that started in August of 2020, you know, still is down about 17% from the highs. When we compare the returns of stocks versus bonds, stocks, the S&P versus bonds, the aggregate bond index, stocks continue to relatively outperform. And we expect that to be the case, even though bonds got a little better starting in March of last year, stocks way outperformed with bonds up 2% uh, and stocks up about 15% over that nine month period. We also talked about relative strength of dividend growth versus bonds for income investors. When rates bottomed in 2020, if you compared the returns for the dividend growth cohort of stocks versus the aggregate bond index, it rallied sharply into the Fed's tightening cycle, held its own going through the tightening cycle. And since the market started to look through the tightening cycle, again, dividend growth stocks showing very strong relative performance, closing actually today at a relative strength new high versus bonds. Now we know the last time that we saw a generational low in rates in the late 1940s, over the next 15 years, rates rose uh, and stocks way outperformed bonds 15% a year for the S&P versus 1.6 for the bond market, which roughly met inflation. I've had a number of conversations this week with clients who said, well, you know, 5% would be pretty good to get uh, in, uh, in a T-bill or in short-term fixed income. But the point is, if you think that inflation is somewhere around three, and you're getting five, and you're gonna to have to pay tax, there's really nothing left. And so we need things that can help offset the impact of inflation. And what happened in the 60s, uh, 50s and 60s was the stocks were the place that people went, particularly dividend growth stocks, because if you could get a rising stream of income against rising inflation, it would help offset and keep you ahead of inflation. We know 
that if you looked at the average annualized asset class performance by interest rate regime in rising interest rate environment, bonds gave a negative return, while stocks gave a return of close to 11% a year. So just by having a combination of stocks and bonds doesn't mean you do well. It just means that the bond depressed your returns in equities. We lean more toward dividend growth stocks. If we look at from the beginning of the bear market in stocks on the 29th of December, 2021, the 10-year treasury currently is down 18% from that date. The equally weighted S&P 500 is now up by 1% over that period, and it was a long period to wait. The dividend growth cohort of stocks up 5% over that period, outperforming the equally weighted S&P and way outperforming the bond market. And we don't see any signs of that stopping. So <clears throat> commodities. We've talked about the fact that commodities exposure is exceedingly low. And I understand it, you know, commodities did poorly for a very long time. They had a bounce in 2020 and 21, but through the tightening cycle, people got bored, I think, thought maybe a recession was coming and that they should be sold. Well, interestingly, you know, the initial strength we saw in commodities basically went sideways over the last two years. And actually this week, starting to poke its head up above this consolidation that they've been in over the last four months. So it looks to me like commodities are getting going for another move. We've seen it in copper. Copper, after a long period of underperformance and a Fed tightening cycle, has started to move up and out of its consolidation range. Certainly, the stocks are acting a lot better. Companies like Foran Mining, companies like Freeport that just beat its estimates last week, uh, Tech Resources, which is ramping up their new QB2 mine, uh, acting better. This is something to keep an eye on. So from an asset class perspective, Equities, in particular global equities, which is why we've uh, uh, converted this uh, equity pool, sorry, equity fund into a global equity fund. Uh, commodities, which are really underowned on a relative basis and on an absolute basis, behaving very well, especially against the tightening cycle. And fixed income, we continue to be bearish or very cautious on the long-term results going forwards. Now, we don't have to be everywhere. We gotta build portfolios that make sense for the market that we're in today. And so we always are aimed at trying to identify what the leadership themes are, what assets are being revalued based on current conditions. In an equity, yes, we wanna see earnings growth and we'll get paid for that, but we also want investors to become more bullish on the asset and be willing to pay a higher multiple of those earnings. So if we get earnings growth plus a higher multiple, that's when you really make money. Multiples tend to expand during cyclical bull markets. And we've just exceeded the highs out of the last cyclical bear market. So we got to take note. What is it that's working? Where should we be positioned? What is it that's got strength relative to the rest of the market? We always want to watch for change, new leadership to emerge, or old leadership to give up the ghost. And in the event that there's no leadership, we're always happy to sit on cash. We are, are running a tactical approach. It just appears right now we're in a more constructive environment. We use three sets of tools always to make our decisions. This is process, not opinion. We know that a high percentage of return comes from getting to the right sectors in the right asset classes. In other words, we need to be positioned in the right neighborhoods. Now, within the right neighborhoods, there's better houses and worse houses. And so we need to find the best securities we can find within those groups that have strong fundamental characteristics and are behaving well so that we can take advantage of all of the factors that drive return. Our top-down work helps us to identify out of all the places we could be focused, which areas, sectors, themes, geographic regions we should be targeting. And then from our bottom-up work, of all of the securities we could choose to build a portfolio, which ones meet our quality tests, which ones are technically sound, so that we can build a portfolio of 20 to 30 securities that gives us diversification, but doesn't make us carry a lot of ballast in the index that isn't performing. So 30 to 30 names, 
in areas of the market that people care about, this is where our portfolio should live. Now we realize that not everything works out. Things change. We misjudge. Information changes. So that it's really important for us to have a clear and defined selling strategy to help us exit the stuff that isn't working. Especially in a bull market when a high percentage of stocks are participating, if we own things that aren't participating or aren't living up to our expectations, we got to be prepared to cut them loose, mark down the inventory and get rid of it to replace it with inventory. People are going to walk into the store tomorrow and want to buy. So <clears throat> the top-down work is driven by trying to identify parts of the market where over time more and more securities are participating in a rally. The easiest way to tell whether a market is constructive or not is to ask the question, over time, are a higher and higher percentage of securities participating in a rally? Is breadth expanding? That means there's money getting put to work. It may be that the strongest stocks keep going in a weak market, but realistically, when a market starts to weaken, the weakest stocks sell off first, and as time goes by, it starts to impact a broader and broader list of, of securities until ultimately even the strongest stocks get hit. So by tracking breadth, whether it's expanding or contracting, we can tell whether things are healthy or whether things are risky. Our job is to focus on putting money to work in areas of the market that are showing expanding breadth, where a high percentage of stocks ultimately are doing well, and being very cautious of those where breadth is narrow, meaning they don't have the sector uh, uh, wind at their back. Okay, when things aren't working, we got to be prepared to use our stop losses. And if breadth is contracting, we want to raise cash, tighten our stops, and put no new positions to work. So we're never, ever going to look like the index. Now, as it sits right now from our breadth models, we saw some pullback at the beginning of January. We saw the percentage of stocks in the U.S. turn lower. And at the same time, we saw the percentage of stocks above their 50-day turn lower, percent of stocks with positive momentum turning lower, percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows turning lower, and percent of stocks trading above their 150-day moving lower. But as you can see, in the last two weeks, all of these have flipped back positive. We now have four of our four short-term indicators all showing improvement. Percent of stocks trading above the 50-day is a measure of the percent of stocks trading above their short-term trends, and that's expanding nicely. Almost 70% of companies on the NYSE are trading above their 50-day moving average. The percentage of stocks with positive weekly price momentum. At the end of December, 84% of stocks had positive momentum or upward trajectory. We were obviously overbought. It corrected. It got down to 8% and has reversed up over the course of this week. The percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows, again, started to expand this week. And the percent of stocks trading above their 150-day moving average, that's a smoothed average of the last 150 days, again, also turned higher. We're now close to 65% of stocks are trading above their 150-day moving average. That's a measure of long-term trend. Global breadth, we highlighted last week, never turned down. Breadth for the Canadian market didn't turn down either. Both of those showing great resilience, New York pulling back a little. So let's talk leadership for a minute. We're now into the heart of the earnings season. We've got a bunch of companies reporting earnings surprises of about 6%. So far, you know, it's a list of companies about about 40% of the companies in the S&P have reported. Uh, sorry, yeah, so 124 out of 500. Uh, and companies are, be, are reporting uh, sales surprises. This week, I've got a bunch of our companies reporting, and today's an important day, both Google and Microsoft reporting after the close. Probably while we're talking here, it'd be interesting to see what, that, what happens there. We also have MasterCard this week, Eaton Corp, which is uh, electrical uh, electrical equipment for manufacturing. Of course, Amazon, one of our key positions in consumer discretionary. Meta, Reassurance Group, which is one of the reinsurance companies and property and casualty companies we're focused on. Bell Ring Brands, Rambus, Vertex, uh, in cystic fibrosis drugs. 
uh, Eli Lilly, which of course is the GLP-1 uh, uh, weight loss drug company in Algoma Steel. So it'll be interesting to see how they do. Let's look at what's setting up coming into this. Starting with tech. Tech continues to be a darling. The relative price strength has been improving since the beginning of January last year, so over a year. The sector, the XLK, made up of large cap tech stocks, continues to trade better than 88% of companies in the S&P over, uh, over the last 12 months. We've had a little bit of sideways chop over the last few days, but it's been very, very strong. The heavyweights in the group continue to act well. NVIDIA making a new all-time high today of 0.85 of 1%, trading better than 98% of stocks in the S&P over the course of the last year. Good job, James Callahan. You did a great job getting us in. We've seen a couple of gaps higher on the chart along the way on earnings. It's going to be a big test to, test to see how they come. They don't come for another 22 days. Microsoft comes today. It's had a great run-up over the course of the year so far. Uh, and uh, Google also has had a really good run so far today. Both, both of these companies report uh, after the bell. Cybersecurity continues to be an important theme. In a world of geopolitical risk, realistically, cybersecurity is very important. Our holdings here have been in, in CrowdStrike and in uh, Palo Alto Networks. Uh, and ServiceNow, which we talked about last week, had a wonderful week. Uh, after reporting their earnings, stock traded up from $720 to $785 over the course of the last number of days. So tech continues to perform, but it's not the only place. Financials really have lit up over the last few months. Starting in June, we started to see relative price strength improve. Over the last few weeks, really improving. Today, the XLF sector, XLF ETF, which is the full financial sector ETF, was up 1.3 versus the S&P down 0.25. A significant outperformance. You can see a really strong move today. Now, we've talked about the banks, uh, in particular JP Morgan. Uh, we've talked about the insurance companies and property and casualty companies like Fairfax, which has done remarkably well. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway that's been doing very nicely. We have intact financial here in Canada. Um, all of these are doing well. And the broad-based index, important to see after the Fed's tightening cycle, has really blasted off in the last three months. This is a big deal. When a sector doesn't make a new high for 15 years, and then eventually does, this is a really important thing to sit up and take note. In fact, the percent of stocks in uptrends in the financial system is almost 100%. So banks, insurance companies, fintech, almost everything is working. Now, I wanted to mention today TMX Group. We've had this now for about 10 months. Uh, it consolidated sideways from September of 2020 through making a new high in June of this past year. And you can see now marching higher. Relative strength has been improving since uh, three months into the bear market. Now, I think that this is an important tell because if, if you really were bearish and thought there were big problems coming from the market, you wouldn't expect the exchanges to do particularly well. Of course, they generate fees on IPOs. They generate fees by selling data. TMX Group has a really interesting data business in the commodity space, certainly you know, this doesn't point to negative things taking place. And we've also had a good run recently in Visa. We talked about Visa earlier in the year and the fact that they win when people do global travel because their transactions on uh, global uh, purchases generally generate pretty significant uh, fees on foreign exchange. So it's had a great week this week. They reported their earnings. Obviously, the market liked it. We're trading at new all-time highs and new relative strength highs. So financials continue to chug along. Um, there's the insurance ETF up 8.8% off the high from back in uh, December of 2021. So really, this, this group made new highs in November, where it took the S&P until January this year to make new highs. So leading, leading the group. <clears throat> and industrials is another group that's similar. If we go back and look at the stock market highs uh, in December, we're almost 6% above, and we exceeded the highs uh, in the early part of December. 
So uh, this is a group that continues to let lead. We've talked a lot about defense stocks. Uh, General Dynamics reported their earnings this week, and boy, they got treated really well also. General Dynamics, of course, in the business of building submarines and naval vessels for the U.S. military. They need lots of that uh, for, for some of the risks in the South China Sea, and they're also building Abrams tanks. Uh, we think the defense sector continues to look good. We talked about Eaton Corp. Eaton Corp reports in two days. You can see it's just broken out of this cup and handle formation uh, going back to August. That's a very bullish uh, uh, technical breakout. Uh, continues to act well. Uh, and so the industrial group marching along and Stantec today closed at a new all-time high. This is uh, one of our big companies in the engineering space. So not much changing in tech, industrials, and financials, the three most important groups in our portfolios, materials. Now the materials coiled during the period that the Fed was tightening, and we mentioned you know, a few weeks ago, poked its head up above that range and came back and retested from the top side. This is a group you would expect to behave poorly if we think there's a recession coming, and it's just not. We talked about uranium over the course of the year. This is the uranium participation units, which owns physical uranium, one of the first materials group to really take off. Cameco would be another holding that we have in this group in most accounts. Uh, across the firm. And actually, if we want to look <clears throat> at nuclear power in general, this is an industrial company, BWX Technologies, which we've talked about on this call, which is in the business of building and maintaining small modular nuclear reactors. You may have read that uh, uh, Ontario Power Generation announced in the last couple of days, they're going to rebuild the Darlington nuclear power plants. This is on top of new nuclear power facilities announced in Saskatchewan and Alberta, and BWX is a large player in the small nuclear reactors. We think this is, could be a really important theme for base load power outside of the vagaries of wind power and solar. Moving on, <clears throat> staying within the materials group, uh, metals and mining group recently broke out of its range. It's starting to look good tech resources on the verge of breaking out of its consolidation range. They said recently that their new QB2 copper mine, which is the most important new copper mine to come on globally, uh, generated positive operating results in both December and January. So it looks like they've worked the kinks out. They're going to produce 250,000 kilotons of uh, copper in this year and expect to double that in 2025 with the addition of additional an additional mill. Energy, again, after consolidating, looks like it's breaking out. Um, I put up uh, the point and figure chart of crude oil last week. We said we needed to see the stock start to follow. Uh, and today the XEG, which is the Canadian oil and gas uh, ETF was up 1.7%. Uh, the exploration and development ETF for U.S. energy companies up 1.8% uh, in the U.S. today. Seasonally, these tend to get going at the end of January, so I think we're positioned well there. <clears throat> in healthcare, we've really only been focused in a couple of pharmaceuticals. Lilly, uh, Lilly's earnings are due in four days. There's been restricted supplies of the GLP-1 weight loss drugs, but you can see we closed basically at a new all-time high today. And Vertex Pharmaceuticals was up 2.6% today to a new all-time high with their uh, cystic fibrosis drugs. They've had a wonderful move over the last few weeks to a new five-year high. Now, I wanted to talk about the consumer today because it's been a group that is a big group in the market. We haven't had lots of exposure, but we've had very targeted exposure and we haven't talked much about it. The first thing I want to highlight is that we've been focused on what we think of as consumer utilities today, things that are just hoovering up demand, right? Amazon has continued to win in retail. And I don't know about you, but my biggest bill every month outside of, you know, some big items, my Amazon bill, 
the relative price performance since December of 2022, uh, when we uh, when we uh, came out of the bear market, has been very very strong, trading better than 91% of companies in the S and P. They report in two days. Uber would be another, and my kids can attest to the utility that they get out of Uber. Uh, our Uber bill tends to be pretty big every month as well, and both of these continue to take demand from take uh, take uh, share from traditional sources for taxis, food delivery, uh, and uh, and the goods that we buy. The other area in the bulge bracket that we've been focused on the consumer is Alimentation Kushtar, which is of course convenience stores uh, across Canada and the U.S. And they've just continued to perform really well also. So really focusing on more sort of the necessities. The traditional utilities continue to behave poorly. The weak parts of the market continue to be things that are acting like the bond market. Things that pay a high dividend, but have very little dividend growth. The dividend growth rate for the utility sector in the U.S. is 3%. We want dividend growth in excess of 10%. That's what's going to help offset uh, inflation. You can see the relative strength continues to weaken. And REITs, things that are helped by falling interest rates, continue to see very weak relative price performance as well. So just to sum it up, if we look at the groups that have the highest percentage of stocks trading in an uptrend, it's financials, industrials, technology, and materials. The red dots are where they were a month ago. So you can see over the course of the last month, all of these groups have seen improvement in the percent of stocks trading in uptrends. And the ones at the far right, staples and utilities, probably the ones we don't wanna focus on. When we line that up with what we hold as a firm in portfolios, 25% of our exposure is in financials. That's double weight the index. Technology, while our positions continue to act well, they are stretched well above the moving averages, are very expensive and very well owned. We are high grading in the best positions, and it makes up now only 16% of our total book. Third place is industrials at a significant overweight to the index. Materials at three times the weight of the index. We think there's excellent risk reward here, and these are underowned in general energy at a small overweight, and really the rest of the groups are all underweight. Utilities, real estate, communication services, consumer discretionary, healthcare, and consumer staples. You'll note that our cash position is very low because our indicators are positive. And our bond positions have been slowly whittled down to use for dividend growth oriented securities. So, there's still a lot of cash out there. A lot of it in the hands of corporations, but a lot of it held in the individual accounts. Flows over the next three months should continue to be very favorable into equities. The measures of risk continue to show that risk is falling, not rising. The excess return that corporate bond investors and high yield bond investors demand versus a, a treasury bond has been falling, meaning that investors think there is falling credit risk in the market. This would be going the other way if we thought there was a bigger and bigger risk of a financial crisis or some kind of interest rate shock. <clears throat> when we look at the measures of volatility, we know that in the best stock markets, the vol measures of volatility tend to be low, 1991 through 98, low volatility. 2003 through 2007, low volatility. 2012 through 2015, low volatility. 2016 through 18, low volatility. 2018, 19, uh, 20, low volatility. 2023, well, you can see where we are. So we watch our breadth models. We watch the credit risk models. We watch volatility. We want to see that our leadership groups continue to relatively outperform. We want to know that our individual positions are acting as they should, given the backdrop from their groups. And should those things change, we'll make changes. But I think right now, it's not time to be bearish. We are encouraging clients to increase their global equity weight 
We're encouraging clients to increase their dividend growth component in their portfolio, taking money from small fixed income weights that they have left. And we are looking forward to what we think is two to three years of outsized returns. So the history is that when the market finally makes a new high after a rest, one month, three months, six months, and 12 months out, things are positive. We could extend this to two and three years, which is also the case. Things get more difficult, we'll get defensive. But as it is right now, we're checking all the boxes and are pretty comfortable with the firm positioning. With that, uh, Pamela, if there's any questions, certainly happy to answer them. Thanks so much, David. Yes, we have a few questions. Um, first, the, the question comes in from one of our favorite viewers, Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence says, David, what is your strat strategy when a position reaches its one year out target price? How do you think about trimming those positions? Are there certain analysts that you think are more correct? So I'm, I don't have a picture for this, but I've got an answer for you. <clears throat> When, when we get into a stronger market, good continues to get better. The first stock to double in a bull market is likely the first one to double again. Don't be afraid of positions that are working. One of the things you can bet on, oh, my video is off, it looks like. One of the positions you can bet on is that you will start to hear analysts saying they are downgrading a stock based on valuation. Very often it is that they don't understand the strength of what's changing in the first place. So I'm, I'm very willing and happy to start cutting out positions that stop working. We're willing to give up a little bit off the top, but especially given the fact we've just made a new all time high, that's the beginning of a new market cycle. You shouldn't be in a hurry to sell your winning positions. Realistically, if you put on 20 positions, two or three will work out way better than you ever expected. They're just getting better faster than you think. Seven or eight would be pretty good and a bunch aren't going to work. A portfolio manager or an investor's success is determined by your ability to hold your winning positions and be willing to cut out the losing positions quickly and move on. You only need 20 to 30 names in a portfolio. So when we start talking about whether something's expensive relative to its peers, it's often because it's a better company. So we do watch when things get stretched way above the moving averages. And in those cases, from time to time, we may trim a little bit. And we certainly watch for any signs of weakness. But really, um, the next couple of years, there will be some stocks you did not expect to have a huge move that will have really big moves and you don't want to sell your winners and hold the ones that aren't doing well, waiting for them to get better. Thanks so much, David. This comes, uh, the next question comes from uh, an anonymous viewer. He's asking, or she, uh, given the strong bull run we have had over the past few months, are you seeing signs that the market is stretched? And is there a slight possibility of a near-term pullback? Look, okay, so there's always a risk of near-term pullback at all times, right? Forget about any indicators. There's always a risk. Having said that, you know, we go through these indicators every week on the webcast for a reason. You know, Weakness will show up in the market internals before you see it in an index, right? So when we look at an index, we're looking at the impact of the very biggest companies. But under the surface, we want to know when the percentage of stocks in uptrends is starting to fail. As long as the percentage of stocks in uptrends is expanding, it's a healthy market. When I show those four short-term indicators, percent of stocks trading above their 50-day, is it rising or not? Yes, it's rising. The percent of stock trading above the 150 day, is it getting better or worse? It's getting better. Percent of stocks with positive weekly price momentum, it's strengthening actually after just having corrected over the course of January. And the percentage of stocks making new highs versus new lows, it's expanding. That tells me that the market internals are sound. 
over time, when bad news happens, if the internals are positive, it's like a shock absorber. There's a predisposition to positive news. On the other hand, there are times when the internals are weakening, and that means the market is vulnerable to an external shock. And I give an example. When September 11th happened uh, in 2001, uh, market internals were exceptionally weak going into it, and the market got crushed. Now, a short time later, markets had been improving, and there was the London train bombings, also a horrific event. Market opened down 300 points on the day, wound up up 400 on the day, because the technical backdrop was resilient. Other things in the market were improving. So I would just say this. You know, we hear the concerns about a slowdown because of interest rates. We hear the concerns around geopolitical risks, which in fact probably are good for materials and industrials, defense companies. We hear all those concerns, but yet the market is digesting all of the news that's out there and showing steadily improving breadth. It means the market's resilient. So don't be afraid of a market making new highs. Right? A bull market generally goes on a lot longer than you think. It goes a lot further than you think. And don't wish it away. It only just started. So uh, I think that uh, you know, we're quite bullish. I think that at some point we're going to see market back off, back off a little bit. My guess is uh, you know, a seasonally end of April, so sort of May, June, tends to be a little sloppy. And as we know, uh, in an election year, it might be a little sloppy into October, but I think that there could be some good money made between now and then. And then we'll see how the market handles the news. We have viewers from all over the world that tune in. And uh, Tom from Punta Gorda, Florida, would love a little uh, further guidance on tech resources. I know that you touched on it briefly, uh, but if you have any other color on that, he would appreciate it. So look, the reason that we like tech resources <clears throat> is it's a big cash flow generating machine. It's very inexpensive and the sector is under owned. We know that supply demand for copper is out of whack where the market is in a supply deficit. We also know that, <clears throat> that you know, there are issues. For instance, the uh, first quantum uh, mine Cobra Libra uh, got shut down by the Pan Panamanians, and that took a significant amount of copper out of the market. Um, there's two times you want to own a mining company outside of you know, just a bull market in, in, in mining stocks. You want to own a company as it is uh, finding a new resource because there's lots of news coming and people get excited about the potential for a new mine. And then at some point, you got to go through the process, have a environmental review, you've got to come up with a mine plan, you got to raise financing, and then there's a long building process before it ever goes. And during that period, it's like a valley in the stock. People get bored and they move on, they do other things. The second time to own a stock is as their new production is coming into existence. And often it can be a little bumpy at the beginning, but then they figure it out. So in the case of tech, their QB2 uh, a copper mine is in production. And in fact, they've said over the months of December and January, everything has run very smoothly. So it looks like they're getting the bugs out. They're supposed to double the production next year, which is not a big technical feat. They just build another mill. It's not about getting the ore out of the ground. So it should be at the point where things are starting to get better and where there, a lot of the risks have been wrung out. So if I look at the way the stock is trading, uh, let's just take a look here. Uh, let's put it on the five year. So this is the last six months as you've been in the run up to the new mine being in production. And within a whisper of breaking out above this resistance. And this is after a bear market in commodity stocks that went on from 2008 through 2023. So the asset class is under owned. The companies that are still there were able to rationalize, pay down debt, get themselves in a good position for the next cycle. And this stock looked like it's ready to break out. 
So I think likely this could be a great performing stock over the next five years. Um, but, you know, I'd like to see the technical break it. But this is a position that we own uh, as <clears throat> a large cap uh, Canadian resource producer that produces uh, into a global market. Thank you so much, David. The last question we have is your views on EWJ versus DXJ. Uh, good question. So what that question refers to is <clears throat> the Japanese ETF EWJ, which owns Japanese equities, unhedged from a currency perspective, in other words, in Japanese yen, versus DXJ, which owns Japanese equities, hedged back to US dollars. So my expectation is that US dollar is likely to weaken. It's generally seen as a safety haven. Uh, and as things get better, it becomes less necessary for people to focus on US dollars. So I'd rather own the, the Japanese equity market in its local currency, because I think the Japanese yen can improve going forward. If you don't believe that that's the case and you just want to own it based in US dollars, DXJ is a way to do it. Uh, and um, both, I think, will make money over the course of the next five years. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, David, as always, for your uh, reviews. I know our um, audience really enjoys them. So I uh, leave you with the final word, as always. And just like that, we're rolling into February 1st. <laughs> at the end of the month. <laughs> listen, I just want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, I know everyone's got busy life. There's lots of choices, things you can listen to. Um, we're certainly happy to talk at any time. Uh, but, uh, you know, we just try to explain the way we look at the world uh, using these tools. And, uh, and you know, there's we've seen a lot of tough periods over the last few years, lots of things to worry about in general. Uh, I think, um, I think uh, things look pretty good. And I'm just seeing a a note come from Bloomberg that Microsoft sales uh, and cloud revenues beat estimates. So we'll see how that performs tomorrow. So anyway, thanks everybody for tuning in this week. Uh, don't be afraid to reach out if you want to have a personal conversation. Uh, we're always uh, interested in talking to new clients and we think there's some great opportunities coming. So uh, everyone have a great week. And, and for those that are here every week, we'll see you again next week. <laughs>